welcome to the Make It Big podcast. I'm Samantha Johnson, Director of Demand, Growth, and Partner Marketing at Big Commerce. Today, we have three very special guests on the show. We're excited to have our three agency partners of the year represented in a discussion about how partnerships and e-commerce successes can be similar and different across regions. Big Commerce Agency Partner of the Year Award is given to certified Big Commerce agency partners that have demonstrated commitment to investing in the platform, executing for clients, and generating meaningful business over the last year. Today, we have Elvis Cola, Business Development at Calicontes with us. Calicontes was our 2022 winner of the Partner of the Year Award in EMEA. Calicontes deals with digital projects with particular attention to e-commerce and digital marketing strategies aimed at optimizing the path to purchase. Their expertise is in multi-channel strategies and integrating their technologies using pre-existing management systems, open source, and third-party platforms. On top, Calicontes is a leading player in e-commerce services, also acting as a merchant of records. We also have Tony Howe, founder and CEO at Mustache Republic joining us. Mustache Republic was our 2022 winner of the Partner of the Year Award in APAC. Mustache Republic is truly an innovative digital solutions partner specializing in leading edge e-commerce technologies and delivering award-winning e-commerce solutions across the APAC region. And last but not least, we have Sergey Ostapenko, president and CEO at Mira Commerce, rounding out our guests for today. Mira Commerce was our 2022 winner of the Partner of the Year Award in the Americas. They are a big commerce focused e commerce agency that powers online commerce by providing a mix of innovative technology and business services to merchants. They connect evolving sales channels and systems that enable truly personalized commerce for mid market and enterprise retailers and brands around the globe. Welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us on the Make It Big podcast. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Great. Well, let's go ahead and dive right in. First, congratulations to all of you on your Partner of the Year wins. It's recognition well-deserved. Let's start by kicking off what that award means to each of you. Sergey, do you mind to walk us through that? Yeah, the, this has been a very special award to me uh, for many, many reasons. Uh, so. You know, first of all, we started the big commerce practice four years ago, and over the past four years, we've been able to build such a credible uh, name in the industry and re reputation. And to be recognized like that reflects uh, the hard work of the team that has put in so much blood and tears and sweat into um, making sure that we deliver to our clients on big commerce. Um, also, it gives us the seal of approval. Um, I think that uh, we are on the right path, uh, and that award is the indication of that. And um, it also sets the standard and raises the bar for us for next year because we intend to win that again and again and again. And for that, we need to improve our game. And so I, I think that's uh, from all sides, it's been fantastic for us. And the, the way we received it was also special to me because I was climbing uh, um, one of the tallest mountains, uh, Aconcagua, the tallest mountain in Latin America. And I was sitting there in the base camp and then climbing to camp three and right before the summit night on February 24th. We got the notice that we received the award, and I got it uh, through my satellite communications from my CTO. So actually, the message that came through says, hey, baby, we got the partner of the year. And I walked outside, and I saw all the Andes all the way to Chile, to the Pacific, you know, and, and the feeling of that uh, was just incredible. To stand there with the commerce flag and know that my team is celebrating at that moment was amazing. So, yeah, that, meant, that means a lot to me. Wow, what a phenomenal way to find out. <laughs> yep. That's amazing. All right, Tony, over to you. What does this mean to you? I mean, we are really thrilled to, you know, uh, win the award this year. And, uh, you know, a bit of a self plug there. This is actually the third time that we won the award. And, uh, yeah, well, you know, totally. They, they said it couldn't be done before, and it's been done. Um, you know, we were, we were really excited. And, and that's really the biggest, um, I guess, Award that we won this year, and uh, we we were so lucky that you know we've been working with Big Commerce for the past five years and winning an award like three times in five years, and it just we really, uh, a good testament to you know our continuous uh, commitment to the platform, and you know as Big Commerce continues to invest in the platform and and you know wait we also continue to invest in the platform and pushing the envelope and you know continue to deliver value to our team um, and and our clients. Um, so yeah, it's been absolutely amazing, you know, winning the award game. Fantastic. And Elvis, what about you? Uh, as uh, uh, also my colleagues have said, uh, means uh, uh, happiness, means uh, energy, new energy. 
uh, it means uh, visibility uh, as well. Uh, it means uh, being uh, supported by uh, a big uh, company like BigCommerce. Uh, so it means uh, also networking. And this is an example. This uh, podcast is a good example how, on how uh, BigCommerce is helping us to get in contact with our colleagues in uh, all over the world. And uh, so it's also made us realizing that we are not too bad. Uh, and uh, so we must be, uh, we must continue to be good, uh, as Sergey said, uh, to continue to win uh, over and over again, uh, this prize. That's phenomenal. We're happy that you're here. So let's move on. I want to hit on how you set up your e-commerce clients for success. You're each on top of your game, but we award a winner in each region because we recognize that regional differences matter. So Tony, let's start with you. What do you see in APAC that you're sure is not a factor for the Americas and EMEA agencies and their clients? Yeah, there, there are some you know uniqueness in the in the APAC region. To be frank, I do not know whether there's absolutely unique to us, but it's it's quite unique. So there are some you know local and poetry e-commerce system you know locally in in a APAC and especially in New Zealand. Um, and these systems were built. And only only used by TV companies, yeah. Um, well, they cannot compete with the like of big arms on the innovation front. They are fully fully localized and actually um, inter interconnected with the local ERP system as well, uh, which is again only used by TV companies. So these systems, um, these companies provide both the platform and services on top of the platform. Um, so we are not really in, so locally, we're not really only just competing with global brands and global e-commerce system. We're also competing with a local, localized um, system. So it's very important for us that, you know, taking something like big commerce um, that is recognized as a global brand, but we also want, need to localize internally enough um, to make sure that we can compete with the local, within the local market. And also it's very important for us to educate um, our market locally that importance to be connected globally and the importance of, you know, using the latest innovation and uh, make sure that we're compatible at a global scale. Uh, so we, we do find that's quite interesting. Uh, we operate across New Zealand and Australia, and we do find that there's quite a bit of a unique thing that's happening in New Zealand. And that's not really, it's not even happening in Australia or the rest of the world as, we, as far as we can see. Okay, interesting. Elvis. What about you? I'll ask you the same question about EMEA. Um, actually, uh, what uh, has been said uh, in, a, uh, in a certain extent is, is uh, true also over here. Uh, uh, EMEA is a, uh, a huge region uh, and uh, uh, it, there are a lot of differences between uh, country to country. Uh, and so we uh, also have uh, uh, small local agencies that are now providing this uh, global scope, this global uh, approach to their customers. So that's what we want to do uh, and uh, what uh, uh, is differentiating ourselves from the others. Uh, regarding the uh, merchants, uh, we see that uh, we are a little bit behind uh, at EMEA compared to APAC and Americas. Um, uh, it means that uh, we need to run or to help our customers, the merchants, uh, to uh, be uh, quick in catching up uh, because this is a, a global competition. Um, so it's not that you, when you are uh, on the web, you are not competing with uh, uh the companies uh, locally uh in your country uh, but you are competing everywhere uh, and so you must have uh you, you you must compete with all your competitors with the customer experience uh that uh, all the others are able to provide with their own uh applications and uh e-commerce ecosystems so uh yes so uh we are behind uh it seems that uh, we are growing faster and it means that we have to be good to support all these customers all these companies that now want to catch up with e-commerce that's really interesting around it being a global competition and then you need that localized experience 
I think that's fascinating. So, Sergey, what about the Americas? Oh, I agree with my colleagues here. So, first of all, I want to make a point about uh, this being a global competition, a global partnership, collaboration, structure, ecosystem. Um, the difference between our ecosystem here in the world of big commerce agencies and people knowing each other and connecting globally is that uh, we really are complementary to each other with the regional expertise and knowledge that we possess. So Mira operates, for example, in Latin America, in North America, in Europe. Our uh, stronghold is North America, but we do reach out to our partner um, colleagues who are actually competitors, but we see them not as the direct competition, but complementary to what we do, because we do understand the necessity to leverage the local skills and the knowledge of the exact situation in the market. Um, I think in the Americas, in North America, uh, we see a couple of things that are very distinctly different from LATAM EU, uh, in that um, we work with brands who are US-based and who are designing their global reference architecture and enterprise architecture and the approach to commerce globally. So the regional brands and subsidiaries and divisions are operating a lot of times, managed by the um, headquarters, and there is a global strategy on how they see this roadmap uh, and the rollout of these local sites governed by the common architecture. And so we get a lot of times into discussions with them about um, how we can implement this new headless approach or a new B2B approach to, um, to support their um, large, medium, and small brands. And so we architect a lot of the uh, um, a lot of the solutions where shopping cart is just one of the plugins. So I think that's a big difference here in the U.S. that um, it's it, it, you know that's evolving. Another difference would be is that I think that B2B wholesale uh, commerce is very much evolved here and it's ahead of uh, any other region right now in terms of complexity, variety of different scenarios, also the necessity to support their like personalization of offers and um, supporting their sales teams uh, who are very, very advanced. Um, and the lay of the land, competitively, it's also very different. So big commerce is very well known in Australia and New Zealand. You know, it's expanding in IPAC. In North America, it's very well known. Um, but the competitive game here is a slightly different one that we don't see in the other regions. So we go mostly head to head with, you know, against Shopify um, uh, proposals, Shopify-based proposals, to some extent, Magento proposals. Headless is evolving and commerce tools is leading in that. And so this is the sort of lay, lay of the land we have here. So hopefully that's useful. It is definitely. There are a lot of differences, it sounds like. So there are a lot of differences, but let's switch over and talk about the commonalities. What's the same? What's a constant across all regions for agencies who will stop at nothing to make their clients successful in e-commerce? Elvis, do you want to go ahead and take this one? Mm, simply the customers or the customer's uh, expectations. Uh, so uh, they uh, expect uh, not only nice uh, pictures <laughs> and uh, a nice uh, purchase experience, they also expect uh, to be uh, supported, to have a, a, a very good uh, uh, customer support, customer service, and also the after sales services uh, must be uh, at the top. Um, otherwise, you easily lose uh, the trust from your customers and they go to, to other merchants. So, um, yeah, this is the same. So uh, customers are uh, uh, more and more uh, greedy when it comes to uh, uh, buying things. Uh, they do all sorts of um, uh, uh checks uh online and offline and so you have to be good and be able to control all your uh, channels and, and make sure that uh, uh your customers are able to find what they need when they need uh and with the, as i said uh, the best experience possible i love that and that's so true across it's the entire experience and it's an expectation Right, not just a desire. They they do truly expect that across every encounter. Exactly. All right. So moving on, we're now entering the holiday season in the Americas. So, what sort of things do you think your clients need to be focusing on in these early stages, particularly those in APAC and EMEA who sell cross border? Tony, how about you? What are your thoughts there? Yeah. Well, this is a bit of an interesting year um, in terms of e-commerce uh, you know, e and e economy in general. Right? 
Um, so really, you know, apart from the general stuff that, that you normally do, like, you know, for, you know, preparing for the holiday season and everything, there are also things like, you know, particularly for this year, like really focus a lot on the forecasting, like forecasting your sales and forecasting your inventory. And, you know, I've been saying to a few of our, like, you know, really talking to a few of our merchants and I do find a few of them are actually more on the conservative side when it comes to doing forecasts, which I actually agree with, uh, especially this year. Um, so really knowing your sales and knowing what is selling well um, in the past few months and prepare for it and also not overcommit in your inventory this year is quite important. Um, and another interesting I find that talking to a few of our clients is that they a few from find that the average quantity per order is actually dropping, but the average order value is actually matching up, which means that people are actually buying less stuff, but potentially more higher value or, or, or more valued products, um, you know, from, from the same company. So if a company this year is really important that they know if there's any difference in terms of the product movement, like what is selling better than the others, it's very important they don't focus based on previous experience, but this year's experience. Uh, you know, there's really one thing on the other sales uh, forecasting, inventory forecasting. The other one is, that I'm not sure if you guys are noticing this, people are launching their sales and campaigns much earlier than before. Um, you know, when I first started e-commerce, like, we'll, we'll launch our Black Friday sale on the day of Black Friday. But now, like, people are launching a couple weeks before. So you see the Black Friday sale, um, you know, spamming your, your email, um, you know, a couple, couple weeks before. I'm not saying that we all have to do it, but it's probably more important this year um, that for the the merchants to get on top of mind, you know, in front of their their customer when it comes to shopping and sales. So even if you don't do it two weeks ahead, you at least notice your customer and say, hey, this is the time when I'm going to do my sale, whatever campaign they're launching for, for Black Friday. So you stay top of mind. So, like, you know, so they don't get lost in other noises and sales that other people are doing ahead of the time. Um, and the, the last thing, I was wanting to mention, especially for this year, is the um, is the payment options that you're making available to customers. Like buy not pay later is pretty much expectation. I was reading an, a survey, like for example, I think it's about fifty percent of U.S. residents like expressing interest in buy not pay later services. So having those services, making that easier for customers to manage manage their cash flows uh, in the current situation is is a very important thing to look into. So if don't, you don't offer uh, payment options like Pay, pay Letter or pay, um, PayPal, pay in full and things like that, it's probably one thing to consider now and get ready uh, at the time. That, that's what I've got in mind for this year. But obviously you have to do all the typical stuff, you know, get your campaign ready, figuring out, you know, your logistics and things like that. And so, that's a lot, <laughs> especially with, you know, and I've seen it too, right? Black Friday, you know, they're, they're starting everything a lot sooner. I will say I'm one of those people that's trying to buy fewer things of higher value. It's really hard to do, um, but yeah. definitely I've seen it in the market. And I think that's a really great point around, you know, uh, buy now, pay later um, being an expectation. Um, and it's really critical as we go into this holiday season. All right. So I'm really excited to hear your answers to this question. This is a question for all of you. I want to know what you see as an emerging trend that e-commerce merchants should really keep an eye on through the rest of this year and beyond. Sergey, let's start with you. Well, first of all, I want to say and, and compliment like Elvis and Tony has been spot on and you can tell why these guys are on top of their game and getting the awards. Uh, it's exactly the trends that we're seeing all across the globe. This year is nothing like the year we've seen before. Uh, the years we've seen before uh, so smearing of these sales offers and being in real-time optimization scenarios is something that we see evolving all the time I, I think the world is changing in that we see more and more people not just replacing the toolkit and spending not so much money on professional services fixing stuff and rolling out features pretty much the framework is already there the tools are there how do you leverage the tools how do you run them in a profitable way that I think is the uh, more most emerging trend I see this year. So after the pandemic, um, as the industry dynamics are changing, the retailers are looking at how to get more money out of that pinata now that they invested millions into before. And so we spend a lot more uh, time doing uh, digital uh, performance audits and reviews for the sites, giving clients the best practices like industry experience, best of breed, like 
ways of solving problems and optimizing continuously, fine tuning the sites continuously. So that's going to continue, I think, well into next year. Um, I don't think that we're going to see a lot more deals um, coming through where companies are going to overhaul their full infrastructure. They're going to experiment with direct-to-consumer launches, um, and BigCommerce is an ideal platform for that. You can launch your direct-to-consumer storefront just like that, be it retail, wholesale, uh, worldwide. So uh, running experiments is really great um, at BigCommerce, you know, experimenting and then running that into the um, main infrastructure of the brand. Uh, headless modernization is something that we see uh, very strongly, and I think my colleague in EMEA will confirm that, that they're much more advanced on this front, and they see a lot more benefit in going headless and doing the composable scenarios. And from the services perspective, I think, um, again, on the optimization topic, you have these soulmates, people who are loyal to you, and then you have all these different audiences that are uh, ex-buyers, maybe ghosters that bought a few times, or hot dates who are starting to buy. Now, how do you bring all of them into this loyalty club that is much more uh, lucrative, much um, more beneficial to work with, and not only profitable, but also, you know, these are the champions of your brand. These are the ones who are going to give you that additional growth and actually leverage your product or service in the best way. Uh, it's all about human connections. And so as long as we keep focusing on that optimization from the point of we don't just want to sell you another Gucci bag, uh, which in some cases can be relevant, or buy another Nissan, we want you to get what you need at that very moment um, to, to fulfill what, what is it you're trying to achieve in life so that you can become hero and fairy. That's what we're in business for. And I think that's, that's becoming so visible that we are in human business, supporting humans making their lives better. Um, so that's what I have to say about that. I love that. Elvis, how about you? What do you see as an emerging trend? I see uh, uh, that uh, we are moving from and pretty quickly from B2C to B2X, uh, business to everything. Uh, means that uh, uh, our customers, our, our merchants are now uh, trying to get ready to involve not only their uh, end users and customers in the platform, uh, but also um, their intermediate um, distributors, uh, all the supply uh, chain. Um, so, and in, in this in this sense, uh, e-commerce is is ready for it. Uh, is natively uh, designed to support it, and uh, we find it very um, uh, easy to offer. When uh, when the merchants, when uh, the the customers, I um, mean the companies, want to reach all their uh, sales uh, systems, the sales uh, channels uh, within one platform. So this is definitely one trend. Uh, uh, of course, uh, everything that has been said uh, by Sergey, I can uh, subscribe. I can uh, uh, under, underwrite. Say <laughs> sorry, and uh, um, and uh, um, uh, yes, we, integration, headless, composable. So you, you need to get all your systems aligned, and you need to get uh, all your departments aligned. So uh, e-commerce is not uh, uh, something that is. Uh, uh, relegated uh, anymore to one area of the organization, but the entire organization should should be uh, set it up uh, to work uh, in an e-commerce way. Let's say I don't have a, a better expression. No, that's that's great. All right, Tony, I'd like to hear from you now. All good points. And I think you know, Sergey and Elvis covered some really great points. And I'd just like to add one thing. I guess talking about emerging trend, you just can't cannot ignore generative AI and, and the development in that space. Uh, I know big companies investing in that space as well when it comes to content creation and things like that. Um, so I guess you know, us as agencies is is really important that we stay on top of that front and working with our clients and try to help them understand what is out there and what is coming up and see what can they do to, to incorporate AI, generative AI, more specifically in their content creation, their customer service, 
and how we can roll that into day to day operation to drive more efficiency for them because efficiency is is what very top topic for a lot of the merchants um this year and 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 to leverage generative AI well like a lot of merchants they not they don't necessarily know this that they need to focus on building that external and internal knowledge base if they do want to leverage AI to drive more efficiency internally internally and also from a customer service front. You can't just expect generate AI to, you know, know exact exactly how everything operating, like know your way of operating things if you do not train it. So it's important that you do um have some level of documentation internally in terms of how you handle certain scenarios and the more information they have, the more powerful and and, and guess personal personalized your UI. Your AI will be in the future uh, for your business. Uh, so start getting ready, you know, on that front. Um, it will be will be very important. So yeah, generative generative AI is definitely one of the areas that we we as a company focusing a lot of our research and, and development energy on, uh, hoping to give our merchants the edge on that front. I was wondering if AI was going to come up, <laughs> so figured it might. All yeah. right. I know we're nearing the end of our time on the episode. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about how you've seen your clients making use of our platform to reach their goals. So this is an open question for all of you, particularly in enterprise. How are your clients winning with BigCommerce? I'll go ahead and go to you first, Elvis. Okay, so I think that uh, the main... Uh, uh things uh that are appreciated uh, are that the, uh, the 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 platform uh is uh flexible so it is easy to personalize it is easy to integrate uh it has all its uh, apis uh, available uh for instance we work very well with our uh order management system. We have our own order management system that we are now starting to promote also to offer to others. We are using now uh, it with our uh, 80 uh, merchants that are under, let's say, our management in terms of uh, services to support the e-commerce. And uh, and uh, now it, it, we, are, we are now starting the set to offer outside. And it is uh, uh, it was easy to integrate uh, uh, it to, to the the commerce platform so um the flexibility and as i said before it is natively uh, uh ready for b2b uh so you can manage really uh, all your uh sales channels uh and the the supply chain with it uh, very easily uh it is fast as we know uh, it's one of the major major features um and uh yeah, uh, overall, uh, when we are able to, let's say, convince uh, our customers to use it, uh, they are always pretty happy with it. All right, Tony, how about you? A, a good portion of our big commerce clients are B2B businesses, and uh, and that's one of the areas that big commerce really shine, and then we can see the continuous investment in that, in, in that space as well. Um, you know, back to with the, the recent launch of the B2B portal, which is like a brand new feature that the company should launch in the B2B edition. Um, so, like, you know, we really love the, really essentially already all of the box function on the big is providing in the B2B, B2B space already unparalleled. But also, I guess the beauty in there is because we're working with these large merchants and they all have a unique requirements and functionalities having the ability to customize on top of what is already in there is absolutely crucial working with the big commerce api and the front end customization has been a brace for our team making sure like i guess the working with the big commerce beauty is they will be able to you know work talk to any large enterprise you know, especially in the b2b space and have the fundamental confidence and say hey no matter what come up with, we'll be able to do it because we know the API is flexible enough. We know the front is flexible enough and that gives us a lot of confidence. I give merch has a lot of confidence as well. But like, you know, we already, well, a good, for, for, for instance, a good chunk of the function, functionality has already been taken care of by big commerce already. And a good chunk of functionality we have already done in the past, we can showcase. And usually just only tiny one or two things will have this customer 
you know, with them with. Uh, but also, again, having a fundamental uh, confidence will be able to deliver them has been absolutely amazing. Awesome. Sergey, how about you? How are your clients winning with BigCommerce? How are clients winning with BigCommerce? Uh, well, um, multidimensional question. So if we focus on the enterprise segment of it, I think uh, we need to fundamentally look at uh, the value components, like dimensions of value. Enterprise needs to create value. So a corporation, a conglomerate, a large division needs to create value for the rest of the organization. And so uh, e-commerce does not have to be uh, a problem, a um, place where we stall and um, come across hurdles. The value created is what? Sales growth, reduction of costs, mitigation of risks, and then finally, uh, growing market share. And I think that for enterprise, big commerce shines on all of those dimensions of value. So first of all, when you deploy the platform, you can run these experiments direct to consumer really quickly and efficiently and fail fast and fine tune and then decide what you want to keep and um, how do you want to tweak the, that experiment, right? So you grow sales with that. The cost of the platform is um, very low compared to what historically enterprise are used to being charged millions and millions of dollars in these servers. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, servers, licensing fees, and even ref share. Um, in, the, in terms of risk mitigation, much more secure, robust updates, uh, real-time uh, support by big commerce, and the level of attention, I want to mention this, the level of attention to partners and customers that I see from big commerce is just unprecedented in the industry. Over the past decade in this industry, I've never seen a team that is more passionate about uh, that support in real time. So if you have the issue that needs escalation, it can escalate all the way to the masterminds of the platform within hours, and they can be on top of your issue if that's critical and material for you. And then um, you have this market um, growth opportunity, right? Market, like part of value is growing your market share. So go omni-channel, go feedonomics, go develop your um, you know, feeds of your products to the marketplaces go connect to various uh, third-party vendors and use the system as a plug-and-play shopping cart in your more exotic scenarios. One of the very exotic scenarios that we um, worked on last year was for a traditional catalog company that sells car detailing and uh, garage auto accessories uh, and sells, sells physical catalogs. We developed the mobile app that you can scan the catalog with and it'll add the products to cart and you can check out through the same big commerce instance that powers their website. You can also scan the product on the shelf and you can add that to cart right there from the shelf of your garage if you're running out of that car wash. You know, so it's a very untrivial way to leverage big commerce, but it powers that. Um, Tony just said that they have great APIs. I mean, you can leverage those APIs to power any kind of front end, any kind of channel that you can invent. And that gives me confidence that we're on the right path with my uh, colleagues here that we chose a right partner in this um, e-commerce world, which is very cluttered with a lot of marketing hype. But when you look under the hood, the commerce really does it. That's fantastic. I loved hearing all of your responses, especially around APIs, flexibility, the support, I thought was a really great point. So that's it for today's episode. I want to thank each of our three guests so much for joining us. We really appreciate your partnership and for you taking the time to give our audience a window into how your businesses are operating successfully and setting up your clients for the same. And to our listeners, thank you so much for spending your time with us on the Make It Big podcast. We'll see you next time.